Hey everyone, this is Jeffrey Wu with the Health Via Modern Nutrition HVMN podcast. And today I'm super excited to welcome on Dr. Paul Mason. He's a well followed, well researched, low carb doctor. Thanks for being on the program, Paul. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Great to be here. Yeah, so you're dialing in from Australia. So it's morning for you, and I recently moved to Miami. So a little bit, I think, closer to your time zone now, or maybe opposite, actually, I'm further away from you now. So a lot to talk about. But before we get into that, you know, why not introduce yourself to our audience here? Yeah, well, g'day. So I'm a sports medicine physician in Sydney, Australia. So I sort of divide my time between uh, performance-based practice with elite athletes and between uh, metabolic health and uh, trying to heal uh, chronic disease, and that's metabolic health and also autoimmune disease. So I've got quite a varied practice and it keeps me on my toes. Yeah, and I think I just find like the most interesting thinkers oh, like are just curious, right? Going from both therapeutics to enhancement, right? Like athletes are essentially enhancing beyond kind of average performance and therapeutics bring people from deficient states to more normal states. I think that is like a broad lens in terms of just helping everyone move towards the same direction. I think you can kind of take lessons learned from either direction to inform the broad practice. At least that's kind of my purview in terms of thinking through the challenges that we think about. Well, I mean, I guess I'm quite lucky because um, I've got a quite an academic bent, so I always like reading papers. But the simple fact is there's things you learn in clinical practice that you just cannot learn from a journal. And it's observations. It's what your patients tell you, what your patients teach you. I'm forever learning from my patients. And I couldn't have half the ideas I have I mean, probably half the ideas I have aren't mine. I'm probably getting them from patients and observations and so on and so forth. So I feel quite privileged to be able to sort of combine a blend of both clinical medicine and I guess an element of academic. Yeah. And I think it's a refreshing perspective because I feel like it's an interesting, I think a holy war, an academic kind of snobbery in terms of clinical anecdotal case study data or, or evidence versus randomized controlled trials. And I think that's something that you've looked at or, or spoken out about and have, you know, thoughtful exposition about this area. But curious to, you know, explore this space a little bit more here, right? There seems to be sometimes a snobbery around, okay, we need to like look at the mechanisms, we need to look at the metabolism, we need to look at the molecular pathways. And I think we oftentimes forget that ultimately the end outcomes matter. And looking at patient anecdotes as a signal to focus our attention to eventually do randomized controlled trials and to unpack mechanistic pathways seems to be, it harkens back to like the original model of science, right? Like looking at observations and then developing hypotheses to answer those observations and, and fit them in a, in a, in a hype framework or a hypothesis. Yeah, and, and things go in both directions as well. I mean, it's very frustrating talking to non-clinicians from time to time who have read certain things in the literature and they can recite it back verbatim, but it bears no resemblance to reality. So, for example, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about the ingestion of carbohydrates and what that does to glycemic control. And they were saying, oh, you know, surely a little bit of this, you know, isn't a problem, rah, rah, rah. And the simple fact is, if you've ever, as a doctor, advised a patient to use a continuous glucose monitor and then had a look at the resulting trace in response to small amounts of carbohydrate ingestion, you will know that glycemic instability in somebody who is insulin resistant is almost guaranteed with even low amounts of carbohydrate ingestion. And unfortunately, what I see with my eyes as a clinician, for some people, doesn't count as evidence because they haven't seen it themselves and they're just sitting there in the textbooks and they've read a line that says glycemic instability does not occur with a carbohydrate ingestion of less than this much. And the simple fact is there's a lot of nonsense written in the medical literature, a complete lot of nonsense. And if you don't have your filter on, your BS filter, and you're able to sieve through what's good and what's bad, then you're going to be left horribly confused. And if you're a doctor, you're probably going to be maltreating patients. Yeah. And I think what you're just touching upon, I think is especially salient right now, because with our ongoing pandemic, I think the average person is thinking about 
their relationship, their understanding of science, of the literature, and also their relationship with figureheads who talk and are fighting over the claims of who represents science almost, right? I think there are certain talking heads that claim that they're speaking science or people are claiming that they believe in science and therefore XYZ policy. So I think one of the things that I think struck to me is that when people just read their holy textbooks as a way to interpret science, and if your observations as a clinician do not match their holy textbook, that seems very religious to me. So curious to unpack that observation and, and, and that analogy where, and I think something that you, you've spoken a lot about, you know, how do we, again, I think those folks would claim themselves to be scientists, right? And it's like, in some ways, their practice of, their practice of science is not very scientific. Love to unpack that thought. Well, I guess, first of all, there's a lot of conclusions that are drawn in the medical literature that are simply unwarranted. So if, for example, we have a look at the Sydney Diet Heart Study or the Minnesota Coronary Experiment, which were both from the late 60s, early 70s, they actually found that removing saturated fat from the diet and replacing it with polyunsaturated seed oils was actually deleterious to health. And yet for reasons only known to the investigators, and I think we can actually uh, paraphrase a little bit here because one of the investigators of one of these studies was actually asked before he died in an interview how they published the results. And the simple fact is they delayed publication significantly. And even when they originally published, I think the Minnesota Coronary Experiment was published 16 years later after the conclusion of the study, they didn't provide data on all-cause mortality. And the study investigator simply said, we didn't like the results we got, so we didn't publish. The Sydney Diet Heart Study, they never published the all-cause mortality data either. And the only reason we actually know the results of these studies today is because somebody went and dug out the results from old basements. They actually discovered them, decoded them, used a, you know, reinterpreted all the results according to uh, good scientific methodology. And lo and behold, we have the results. Large scale randomized control trials show that eliminating saturated fat from the diet in place of polyunsaturated fats, that is, reducing your saturated fats, actually increased mortality. And we would never know this. Um, this was good quality science that was destined to be lost to history. The Women's Health Initiative is another example, a little bit more surprising because it's in the modern era. They actually had a largest randomized control trial in the world, 700 million US dollars. And they had a, a group of females who went on a low saturated fat diet. And the only statistically significant finding from the whole study was a 26% increased risk of complications such as angina and heart attacks and so on and so forth. And given that that was the only finding of the whole study, you would think it would be front and center of the results, front and center of the conclusion, mentioned in every press conference. Well, strike out on all three accounts. It wasn't in the results table, it wasn't in the conclusion, it was never mentioned in any of the press conferences. It was written in obscure language on page 661 of the reporting journal. This is just absolutely amazing. You know, we have solid science and it's literally buried. And we have plenty of other examples of this going on. We have misinterpretation of bad science. So in 2020, I came across a paper that studied cholesterol supplementation and atorvastatin, which is a statin, a cholesterol-lowering medication use, in New Zealand white rabbits. Clearly, you know, has no applicability at all for humans. And yet in the conclusion, the authors of this paper suggested their results did apply to human patients. This is 2020, and we're using rabbit data to inform our use of statins. There was another study that actually looked at statin use and it found that it actually increased the incidence of diabetes. So if I actually can quote, they said that uh, it was a New England journal, actually this is a few years old, 2008, but it was a statin trial, 
uh, they found that there was a significant increase in physician-reported incidence of diabetes, and there was a statistically significant increase in HbA1c, which is a marker of average blood glucose levels. The authors also acknowledged that prior to this time, there were independent studies that confirmed worsening sugar control for at least three different types of statin medication. So on the basis of this, they had statistically significant findings. Now, my understanding and everybody's understanding of statistical significance is that it represents findings that are unlikely to be due to chance. We want to take out the element of chance and we do that to a, a, you know, a reasonable degree. Still, in the conclusion, these authors said, well, this worsening sugar control could reflect the play of chance fires the logic of having statistically significant findings. They simply could not compel themselves to look at the science and understand the science and say, oh, maybe statins are bad for diabetes. Maybe this is the evidence. Nope, they just said, oh, look, it's probably a random chance. Never mind that it reached statistical significance. And if we have a look at how else the data is abused, so we have these expert papers. So there's a problem where we have something called uh, eminence-based medicine, and that's totally contrary to evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine means we look at the data, we draw a conclusion. Eminence-based medicine means that we put our trust in other people, not the data. We actually allow eminent people, experts, if you will, to provide us with their conclusion because they're clearly smarter than we and we can accept at face value everything they say. So there was a paper from the American Diabetes Association, which is very, very heavily cited, and it's on the use of statins in diabetes. And I had a lot of people tweeting this paper at me and emailing me this paper and saying, see, this proves that statins are good in diabetes. I went and looked at the references. There were six references on this paper. Three of the references did not include all-cause mortality as a measure of outcome. That is, they couldn't, they didn't actually ask the question, let alone answer the question, whether taking statins for diabetes, patients with diabetes made them live longer. The three studies that they included that did actually ask the question about all-cause mortality, they all had insignificant findings. Not one of the references in this paper showed what they said it did. And yet this is a very heavily cited position statement from an expert body that recommends the use of statins in diabetes. And this is just madness. And if people actually understood that the wool was literally being pulled over their eyes, you can't trust the conclusion, you can't trust these guidelines, you can't trust these expert bodies, you have to look at the raw data. When you look at the raw data, the truth is very, very different. Yeah, I think the terminology of eminence versus evidence is very, very spot on. And one thing that I want to just unpack further is the motivation. Like, this is the part that like confuses me where I don't think the folks who are publishing or writing these papers and either inadvertently being biased and not self-aware of being biased, or are they, you know, hopefully, you know, in, like more on the corrupt side. I, I, I tend to just be good faith and assume that, you know, these are doctors who want to do well by their patients. I mean, it's hard for me to understand the motivation where if there is something that is statistically significant, right? Like that is kind of the gold standard. If some result, some out, out end point is P less than 0.05, that tends to be something that, again, statistically means not by chance. And second point, the, the main outcome for all of these interventions should be all cause, all cause mortality. Do you think that, you know, maybe to just from a devil's advocate perspective or trying to understand their position, do you think that they are saying that cardiovascular disease risk or a heart attack is more dangerous, therefore increasing or slightly increasing diabetes risk because it's more of a chronic disease is better for the end patient outcome than, you know, like increasing the rate of a heart attack because that's more of a fatal disease condition. I mean, what is the best possible interpretation? So I don't think there's any ulterior motives on the side of doctors who are 
you know, making these conclusions. I think it just comes down to pride and intellectual arrogance. They're used to being the smartest people in the room and they really don't want to concede that they could be wrong about anything. And I mean, I can speak to this from personal experience because I haven't always been an advocate of low seed oil, low carbohydrate, ketogenic style diets. You know, I used to be, you know, lock, stock and barrel straight down the line, making these recommendations that people eat low fat, so on and so forth. And I was absolutely adamant in that. And the position I was coming from was supreme confidence that I'd had an academic education and therefore I was right. I just hadn't even considered the possibility that I was wrong because I trusted the people who had taught me. So I don't think that there's any uh, ulterior motives. I don't think for the most part that people are actually setting out to try and harm people's health. I think that's just an unfortunate outcome of not being humble enough to consider that you might be wrong. Which, uh, which is disappointing in the sense that I feel like the true scientific ethos or spirit is to be humble is to doubt, is to, I mean, hubris is essentially the, the, the antithesis to science for me because science is about asking questions and challenging your own assumptions and frameworks, not to ascribe your view on everyone else and fitting the observations to your model, right? Like that is a very religious statement. That's a very religious stance. Yeah, I have the holy book. I have the answers. And therefore, I need to ascribe all the observations to this dogma. Well, fortunately, I mean, I get excited when I read a research paper where they actually find against their original hypothesis and they report it clearly as such. And two examples come to mind. There was a paper from the American uh, Journal of Cardiology in 2004, and they predicted that saturated fat would increase LDL oxidation. So just to make very clear, LDL, li- uh, low-density lipoprotein, which is often pejoratively and incorrectly referred to as bad cholesterol. So LDL in and of itself is not harmful. But if that LDL becomes damaged, and one of the ways it becomes damaged is through oxidation, then it can contribute to what we call the atherosclerotic burden or, or plaque, basically uh, lining your blood vessels. So this paper predicted that If people had more saturated fat, they would have higher oxidation levels of LDL. And in actual fact, they found that it was polyunsaturated fats or vegetable and seed oils that did this. And in their conclusion, they stated, these experiments provide convincing evidence that our original hypothesis was not correct. Clear, unambiguous language. And I think that is just fantastic science. That is how science should happen. We saw something similar. So just on the 25th of February this year, 2021, there was a Cochrane systematic review published on vegan diets and cardiovascular risk parameters. And interestingly enough, they looked at all the randomized control trials that had been done on vegan diets. And not one of those trials, not one randomized control trial available for this systematic review actually looked at clinical outcomes. What that means is it didn't actually look at things that actually matter to patients. It didn't look to see whether they had shortness of breath or they had uh, impaired cognition or how they you know, whether they had more heart attacks or these kind of things. So the only thing we can rely on for this research is surrogate markers. Surrogate marker means we see something like a blood test moving in a certain direction and we would assume that that's bad because our experience is that you know high triglycerides for instance is not a good sign that a lowering of your hdl good cholesterol is not a good sign and this systematic review actually found that hdl cholesterol went down on vegan diets and that triglycerides increased And they actually acknowledged that these changes in the lipids were opposite to what they had predicted. Now, funnily enough, I suspect they meant to write opposite to what they had actually hoped for. But either way, they actually did acknowledge that the changes of these direction and certainly suggesting that uh, they're actually not good for health. So I think the state of affairs is, as of the 25th of February 2021, the best evidence we have for vegan diets on health 
appears to be deleterious. That's fascinating. And thank you for summarizing so articulately the results. But it's fascinating that that headline was not well publicized in mass media. I, I had not really heard about it until just a pre-conversation where you highlighted that meta study. You would think that one of the trendiest celebrity endorsed food trends, food trends, which is going vegan, going plant-based, is as as like you know, saving the environment, saving uh, human population, saving human chronic disease. Again, I think that those are all kind of separate points, but especially the latter two, you would think that there would be more of a mass media uproar that, hey, all these celebrity promoted diets of going vegan is actually deleterious to your health. Uh, I mean, how do, you, how do you make that kind of dissemination of... Well, I'll tell you how they did it. They were able to obfuscate the data because the LDL change, the LDL actually also went down on a vegan diet. And it depends on your worldview of LDL. If you subscribe to the old debunked theory that LDL is a bad thing, then you can say, well, maybe these, uh, these changes in HDL and triglycerides are offset by the change in LDL. But the simple fact is a lowering of LDL is almost certainly associated with an increase in cardiovascular risk. So, and we've got meta-analysis and systematic level of, you know, level of data proving that. If I give you an example of one study, so it was done by Bartham, B-A-T-H-U-M, in 2013, and they had a touch over 118,000 subjects who were all over age 50. And what they actually found that the people with the highest level of LDL had on average about a 50% reduced chance of dying than the group of people with the lowest LDL. So you can even, you can flip that the other way and say that if you have the lowest level of LDL, your risk of dying is doubled. Now, there's a lot of people who say, oh, there's reverse causality because LDL tends to go down when you're sick and therefore it's not fair. That's, you know, we're just selecting people who are sick and, uh, you know, it's taking people at the very end of their life when they're about to die. Well, these people were aged over 50. So there's still a lot of life left in at age 50. They also excluded people with diagnosed heart problems and cholesterol problems who were, had been prescribed statin medication. That excluded people with cardiovascular disease. They excluded people with diabetes. They excluded people with any hint of terminal disease at all. So for all intents and purposes, this was a healthy, younger population. And they found that the lowest LDL level increased your all-cause mortality by about double compared to having the highest all-cause mortality. So unfortunately, this is not well understood. So the authors of the Cochrane Review, obviously I'm suspecting they're still clinging to this old model of LDL all being bad. They're then able to twist their findings and say, well, because the LDL went down on a vegan diet, that might actually be a good thing, which is totally contrary to the evidence at hand. So kudos to them for acknowledging that the triglyceride and HDL changes went in the wrong direction for them. But uh, unfortunately, it's going to take a little while before they let go of this whole LDL business. Yeah, let's unpack the LDL story more. We've talked to a number of folks, including Dave Feldman, who speaks very you know nicely about his you know the lipid energy hypothesis or model. And then one thing that's always been interesting, interesting to me is that there's still this focus on LDL in isolation. And I think going back to your point, my read of the literature is that you have to really take the triad of HDL, triglycerides, and LDL to really understand the lipids and the lipid metabolism of a human. And, and there's likely other factors that make it much more complicated. Well, it's I actually mean, not that complicated. But, but like people are still interpreting it wrong, right? Like, please break it down. So LDL serves an important function in our body. If we had no LDL, we would simply die. Uh, full stop. However, LDL can be damaged. And if the LDL becomes damaged, then we have a problem. And because what actually happens is that normally our LDL has a lifespan. Our liver excretes something called a lipoprotein. It's called a very low density lipoprotein. As that very low density lipoprotein, it's like a big boat and it's got triglycerides and cholesterol inside. So cholesterol is just a molecule. 
Cholesterol doesn't actually mean LDL. LDL is so much more complex than cholesterol. It's what we call a lipoprotein. It's a complex structure, but it carries some cholesterol inside. So this term to call LDL cholesterol is just frankly wrong. You know, otherwise, if, if a passenger was riding on a bus, you know, you, you don't call the bus the passenger. The bus is the bus. The passenger is just what's inside. So just because the bus is carrying somebody called Jeff inside, the bus's name isn't Jeff, you know, to give a bit of a silly example, but that's how silly it is. That's literally what they're saying. So this uh, VLDL molecule gets released from the liver and it deposits, it gives cholesterol to tissues around the body that need it. It gives triglycerides to where it needs to be for energy or for storage. And as it does so, it shrinks. And as it shrinks a little bit, it gets an arbitrary name change to intermediate density lipoprotein. And then as it donates a bit more of a cargo, it shrinks again. It's like a, a deflating balloon. Same, same particle, it just now has a different name, arbitrarily different name. And after it goes from intermediate density lipoprotein, it becomes a low density lipoprotein. And then this low density lipoprotein can be taken back up by the liver and the cycle continues. And this is important for life. And it's also got immune functioning roles and a bunch of other stuff. Now, if the LDL is damaged, the pathway by which the liver takes it back up out of circulation stops working. Basically, you've got one molecule on the outside of the LDL molecule that, or the particle that identifies it. It's called an ApoB100. That's the security swipe card. And if you damage that security swipe card, then you can't get taken out of, out of the blood by the liver and then you start to accumulate. And one of the things that can damage this ApoB100 security swipe card is oxidative stress. So we actually know that it's oxidative stress that turns LDL bad. And if LDL is damaged, then it can accumulate inside the internal wall of the blood vessels. And interestingly enough, our old perspective, indeed my old perspective of how the LDL actually entered the wall, we used to think it would somehow diffuse across. Well, this looks like it's entirely false. Um, it actually looks like on the if you've got a long blood vessel going down, you've got little small blood vessels coming in from the outside. They're called vasa vasorum. It's basically a tiny blood supply to the big blood vessel. And these LDL particles actually travel through these small blood vessels and they can lodge into the middle of the wall, what we call the intima, and that's where the, these fatty deposits form. But if your LDL is not oxidized, that process doesn't occur. And the interesting thing is that a high triglyceride level and a low HDL level are really just markers of oxidative stress. That, that's a simple way to think about them. So if we just think about, you know, Damaged LDL is what causes the deposition. And if you have a high triglyceride level and a low HDL level, then you're much more likely to have damaged LDL particles. And it really is that simple. And it's, this is well supported by evidence too. So everybody's worried that once you've got these fat deposits in the, the blood vessel wall, well, well, they must be there forever. Well, that's not true. We know that what we call plaque regression is possible. And in observational studies on plaque regression, they actually found that some people were able to get their plaques would actually disappear or they would actually shrink over time. And some people, their plaques would actually get worse. They would actually increase or progress. And what they found was that those people who had plaque progression on average had LDR levels about 50% of those people who had plaque regression. Think about that for a second. We've actually got documented evidence in observational studies that it's possible to reverse these atherosclerotic plaques. And the people with the highest LDL levels are the ones who get reversal. The people with lower LDL levels actually have progression. And I don't know about you, but just that single observation should be enough to debunk this whole LDL myth that all LDL is bad. Yes, LDL can be bad, but only if it's oxidized. If you're otherwise metabolically healthy and it's not oxidized and it's not damaged, then you're going to be okay for the most part. Now, there are some things that we know that increase oxidative stress, and that's seed oils and too much sugar or too much carbohydrates. 
So we know that when the blood sugar levels are going up and down, we've got very good evidence that that generates oxidative stress. That generates these reactive oxygen species or these uh, electrons with an unbalanced valence shell electron that can actually damage other tissues. So you don't want your sugar to be going up and down every other moment. And the other thing is seed oils, by definition, they've got bonds that are prone to oxidation. And when you consume them, these oxidation products actually literally get taken up by these other particles called chylomicrons and get delivered to the liver. And we've got evidence, we can see this on electron microscopy, where these oxidized particles actually lead to damage of the liver, insulin resistance, and they actually then through a whole series of downstream events lead to your triglycerides going up and your HDL going down. So if you're worried about your LDL level, don't worry about saturated fat because saturated fat will make your LDL go high. Sure, it can do that, but it won't make it go bad. What will make your LDL go bad is having very unstable glucose levels and consuming a lot of oxidized seed oil. Paul, that was amazing. That was one of the most clearly articulated descriptions of uh, the LDL story. I want two follow-up questions. So obviously, I think when people go to their lipid panel, there's the LDL, HDL triglycerides. Is there a simple clinical blood marker where you can measure this? Can Is there like an ox LDL that you can derive from a blood panel? So yes and no. You can actually measure LDL directly. So, and that's very easy. So when the LDL gets oxidized, these little surface proteins actually denature. They actually shrink. They change their structure. So if you damage an LDL particle, there's a tiny, tiny fractional shrinkage of it. And this is what we call small dense LDL. I'm sure you've heard the term. Now, this is actually a terrible term because we have people talking about these large fluffy molecules and small dense particles as if there's a significant size difference between them. It's infinitesimally small. It's a tiny size difference, but it is measurable. We can actually measure it. Japanese scientists way back in the 90s, they've actually figured out that when you actually have sugar, binding to the LDL particle that denatures these proteins and lead to a shrinkage. We've actually got evidence that glycation damage as well as oxidation damage leads to small, dense LDL. Now, we can put a sample of your LDL into a gel and we can either centrifuge it, so spin it down, or we can apply a current through it, so-called lipid electrophoresis. And both of those measures reliably separate out the LDL based on the density, the size of it, so either. And we can actually then see how many different LDL populations you have. Normally, you should only have one smooth peak, and that's, uh, that's basically healthy LDL, physiological LDL. That's not going to harm you, not in 100 years. That, that's good LDL. But if you start having it damaged, then you'll see more peaks. So the first step is you'll get a second peak. And my clinical experience is that when I correlate people with two peaks with something called a coronary artery calcium score, which is a direct measure of calcification inside the vessels that correlates very tightly with heart disease, that having a second peak doesn't seem to be overly problematic, but it's obviously not ideal. But once you start getting three peaks or four peaks or five peaks, then all bets are off then we start seeing significant uh, atherosclerotic burden. So you can actually directly measure this damage in your LDL by either one of those two methods. Having said that, this is not a simple blood test. Um, people don't generally do it. In Australia, it costs about $127, I think. So it, it's not over the top, but you know, it's, it's not free. If we have a look at triglyceride and HDL, though, we know there's this association with oxidative stress. And we've got very reliable associational data. It's not as good as directly measuring it, but we can infer with a high degree of reliability whether somebody has good or bad LDL simply by having a look at the ratio. And we do something called a triglyceride to HDL ratio. We divide the triglycerides by the amount of HDL. And depending on which part of the world you're in, because we use different units, we have slightly different thresholds. But basically, and I've actually got a, a couple of lectures online where I talk about this and talk about what thresholds are generally associated with what we call a pattern A, 
LDL pattern or a non-oxidized LDL. So yes, that's that's a pretty reliable test. That's again, uh, I'm just like connecting so many dots that I didn't realize were so directly related because I know exactly what kind of like advanced lipid panel that lets you do the small dense LDLs. And I remember there's like a different segmentations and these exactly correlate to the curves in terms of the peaks of LDL. I just didn't, I just failed to realize that oxidative damage LDL is essentially small dense LDL particles, right? Like that's essentially the, the proposition here. And we can see it because it can be damaged in multiple ways. And so basically you can, you can see between one and five peaks if you actually do this uh, centrifugation or lipid electrophoresis. And I can tell you that if you've sort of, if you've got, you know, three, four or five peaks, then you better start on your wine cellar or you better do something about your health. Yeah. So for folks then, I'm just going down that path, you know, when people go on a ketogenic or low carb diet, oftentimes, or sometimes you see an elevation of LDL. So your response, your follow up to that is that actually do a more detailed LDL study to understand if that's just healthy, you know, happy LDL, or are you actually seeing elevation of small, dense LDL? And you should be therapeutically concerned or clinically concerned if that's small, dense LDL rather than just generic LDL. Or have a look at your triglyceride and HDL level. And this is why this vegan study was so interesting, systematic review of randomized controlled trials, because they found that the LDL level reduced, but because the triglycerides went up and the HDL also went down, we can infer that they had an increased unhealthy population of LDL at the same time that the LDL level was going down. You know, it's a real double whammy. They're getting the worst of both worlds there. Oh, wow. So so they did see increase in small dense LDL as LDL went down in the vegan study. They didn't measure it, but we can infer that because we know there's a reliable connection between high triglycerides and low HDL and oxidized LDL. So almost certainly if they had have done lipid electrophoresis or centrifugation on their LDL particles, they would have seen the LDL population uh, was increasingly unhealthy and they were heading towards an LDL population that you do not want. 100%. And I would agree with that hypothesis. I'd love to see that study actually run so we can actually definitively say that that is causative. But I can also just, again, from a devil's advocate perspective, um, what would be the mechanism to, because again, HDL triglycerides associates to small, you know, poor ratio associates to small dense LDL elevation. What would be the described causative relationship versus just the observational associational relationship? Why does that uh, ratio drive small LDL or small dense LDL? Excuse me. The VLDL production from the liver is strongly associated with insulin resistance. And when we have oxidative, we ble- the liver is at the heart of this. If you have oxidative damage going to your liver, there's a reason that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and why we worry about liver enzymes so much. And there's a couple of pathways there. Uh, one which is sort of uh, has been talked about for a, probably a couple of decades now is retinol binding protein 4. And it seems to just link in the oxidative damage to some of the hepatocytes. And there's a whole enzymatic cascade, which I I can't possibly pretend to fully understand. So it's more observational and associational data, but we have actually got cause and effect experiments where we can actually see if you create that oxidative stress, then you do get an increase in insulin resistance. And that then leads to an increase in triglycerides. Now, so we know this relationship to be true, but for me personally, I think we still need to tease out some of the uh, molecular details connecting steps to steps. But probably retinol binding protein 4 is certainly one of the key players. And then we have a, uh, there's a whole lot of other chemicals that are, that are involved there. And, uh, you know, guys like Ben Bickman are actively researching some of those at the moment. Got it. So essentially when you have insulin resistance, you have less efficient glucose uptake. And in, 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 in order to maintain energy balance, you probably have a higher a little bit of triglycerides to kind of capture that energy deficit. So you have higher ambient triglycerides would be, you know, one way to kind of model out the system trying to balance itself. Yeah. So, I mean, insulin resistance is, as we know, at the heart of metabolic disease. But I guess if we take that a step further, then a, insulin resistance starts with problems in the liver. Got it. Yeah, no, it's, it's again, very elegant. Uh, again, it, it, this is, I mean, I'm just getting a, just 
a much clearer articulation of, of, of the model in my head through this conversation. Another point that I wanted to talk about is the spiking of blood sugar and how that drives oxidative stress. I know within nutrition Twitter, there's been more recent debates around, does that, you know, when there's a the growing popularity of continuous glucose monitors and now potentially healthy people, biohackers are now using CGMs to just track their, their diet. And some of the skeptics would argue, hey, there's no data suggesting that for a healthy, metabolically normal person, that glucose spikes are problematic. That's just the normal digestive process. When you have carbohydrate, you of course have a bolus of glucose and you just process it down and it's fine. And then the, another piece of evidence that they would argue would be that if you're eating a low carb diet, you have a, 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 an acute spike of free fatty acid and triglyceride that attenuates as you digest it. So are you trading off a, a glucose spike for a triglyceride free fatty acid spike and what is better? This is the kind of argument you get from people who aren't clinicians. And that may sound a little bit disrespectful, but the simple fact is, if you are metabolically healthy, you can undergo oral glucose tolerance test with almost zero deviation of your sugar supply. So to talk about people who are metabolically healthy with extreme glycemic variability is an oxymoron. People who are metabolically healthy don't tend to have that degree of glycemic instability, full stop. So I actually, when we debate about whether it's possible to reverse type 2 diabetes and people say it's only being controlled on a healthy diet, it's not actually being reversed. Nope, that's not true. I've actually done hundreds of glucose tolerance tests with insulin, otherwise more commonly known as a craft test. And I've got multiple patients who have actually been able to restore flat glycemic control in response to a 75 gram load of glucose. Now, uh, number two, we actually have solid evidence from the mitochondrial level that there is oxidative stress that is generated when glucose is a source of fuel. And the greater the flux of glucose, the greater the oxidative stress. Uh, we've got ground level, almost molecular level data confirming that. And then we have experimental data that also shows that. So we actually know that uh, vegetable oils are oxidized. And when you consume them, you actually have these circulating oxidized molecules in the blood that we can measure. We can actually measure the oxidative load after somebody consumes a load of vegetable oil. And then they did a very nice study. They got subjects who were either insulin sensitive, which means their insulin levels worked well and their glucose levels were well controlled or insulin resistance, which means that their sugar levels were going up and down. And then they gave them the same load of oxidative stress. And they found that there was a huge increase in both the amplitude of oxidative stress in those people who are insulin resistant that persisted for well over 24 hours after one meal of seed oils, oxidized seed oils. And for anybody who's thinking, oh, that's good, I don't have any oxidized seed oils, by definition, if you're having a seed oil, it is oxidized. There's no other way for it. And olive oil doesn't escape either. The reason that these oils oxidized is because they've got these uh, unsaturated bonds. The only difference between a polyunsaturated oil and oleic acid, which forms 70% of olive oil, is that there's only a single bond prone to oxidation olive oil, whereas there's multiple of them in seed oils. So olive oil is too prone to oxidation just to a lesser extent by virtue of having less of these bonds. Saturated fats, by definition, they don't have any of these bonds that are prone to oxidation. So there is absolute clear evidence that this glycemic instability from a mechanism and from subjects who actually are insulin resistant with poorer sugar control, that actually does lead to these much higher levels of oxidative stress. And if you've got these oxidative molecules circulating around your body, have no doubt that they're reacting with some of your liver tissue. They're contributing to worsening your insulin resistance. Again, it's a vicious cycle, as well as uh, potentially interacting with LDL molecules in your blood and damaging them and, and so on and so forth. Got it. And, and so for folks that are making the, uh, the opposite argument where, okay, if you're trading off not eating carbohydrate and therefore you're eating, eating very, very high fat, 
it's almost a straw man argument where that fat is an oxidized polyunsaturated fat, which uh, it goes back to your thesis that that is or, like bad for insulin resistance anyways. But if that was replaced by saturated fats that are not oxidized, that is strictly better than uh, a glucose bolus and a, a polyunsaturated fat bolus that was likely oxidized, right? So it's just a sort of stack ranking, you know, any kind of substrate is gonna do some sort of ROS production, right? Like if you eat anything, metabolism happens and there's likely some oxidation, oxidative stress. And we're just stack ranking that uh, saturated fats are least prone to generating extra oxidative stress. Would that be your argument or thesis? Well. Yes, and that's not just my thesis. Remember this 2004 paper from the American Journal of Cardiology where they actually hypothesized that saturated fat would cause oxidative stress in LDL and they found the opposite. And when they said these experiments provide convincing evidence, our original hypothesis was not correct. I mean, they actually, they've found it. it you know, there's multiple lines of evidence. This is not just a single paper that's been extrapolated here. We've got biological phase validity. We've got uh, epidemiological data. We've got experimental data. All the signs are pointing in one direction. Poofers are bad. Polyunsaturated fatty acids are bad. They lead to oxidative strength. I, I think you make a very, very compelling uh, narrative and argument for the case here. But like we still pick up the Cheerios pack and there's still the American Heart Association saying, hey, this Cheerios is heart healthy, even at the face of the papers and the data that you're citing. And I think that, you know, folks like myself and then just the broader ketogenic community, I think is early to seeing and interpreting the data that, the way you're articulating it. You know, what in your estimation is going to actually finally change broader perception? I mean, I, I, I agree with you that the evidence seems to be stacking more and more in terms of how we interpret the world, what's going to finally tip it? Is it an unwinnable battle because there's too much entrenched in interest in big pharma and big food? Is it just that we need to wait for the previous generation of academics to die? And then we take over and just say, hey, like there's this new paradigm to think about. Is it happening now? I feel like, you know, the communities are growing faster than ever, you know? So, you know, what in your estimation finally tips it? Or is it just like, keep fighting the good fight, keep talking about the science and evidence, and then truth will eventually win. The simple fact is we need removal of commercial interest from our food guidelines. People are under the uh, misconception that the dietary guidelines are formulated based on food that's healthy, and that simply is not the fact. There's a whole lot of other commercial interests and lobbying interests that feed into that, including the food that's currently available, the food supply that, you know, if everybody overnight went on a healthy diet, there would be food shortages because there's simply not enough healthy food around. So all of these kind of interests actually play into the advice that the governments around the world give their populations on what to eat. So people should not be under the, the misconception that uh, the dietary guidelines are what is healthy because they're not. They're, they're absolutely not. And if you read the fine print, they say, well, these guidelines apply to people that are healthy. So if we take the American population, there was a national survey that found that based on five markers of metabolic health, only 12% of US adults are healthy. Think about that, 12%. So by definition, the dietary guidelines in America only apply to 12% of the population. I, uh, I find it illogical that anybody recommending an alternate diet could ever be accused of mispractice simply because of the fact that the dietary guidelines don't apply to most people in America. That's a, a nicely point, poignant point there. One thing that, you know, that, that got me thinking about was in terms of the food system and where we've come in terms of like the availability of food is that the modern food system was designed for an 18th, 19th century problem, which is famine. Essentially, a shortage of food was the biggest killers of humans before the modern era. And that's and our solution to that was hyper-processed shelf-stable foods. And oftentimes, the cheapest form of that is very, very high glycemic response carbohydrate. It's very, very stable. You put very, very cheap polyunsaturated seed oil fat in there. It's hyper-palatable, hyper-processed, and very, very stable. You can ship around. You got a lot of calories over in the world. And that did solve famine, right? Like for 99% of the world, 
there's not a calorie deficit. The problem of starvation today is literally a logistics problem, right? Some political logistic problem where we cannot get to that last mile of delivering some calories to some poor folks in, in some region of the world. So while we've solved that problem, I think we opened up a new can of worms, which essentially we, now we realize that we're putting all of our people into metabolic crisis where we're just delivering like completely the wrong combination of macros and calories to people. Well, I also think that there's something else even more important that we as humanity are slumbering into, and that's the environmental destruction of topsoil, of soil. And the problem with uh, agriculture is that every time you take a plough to soil, you expose trillions of bacteria to the sun, to the wind, we basically denude the soil. There's no surer way to turn soil into dirt than to plough it. And unfortunately, this is a finite resource. And ruminant-based agriculture can actually regenerate soil while ploughing it actually denudes it. And we are going to reach a point where topsoil is completely denuded and we can no longer produce food. If we have no topsoil, it doesn't matter if you're a vegan or a carnivore. There is no food. Now, if you have uh, uh, grazing ruminant animals, they will actually feed on the grass. So the, the grass is uh, converting energy from the sun, photosynthesis into cellulose and providing nutrition. The cow is eating the grass. The cow is then fertilizing it with manure and also with water, with urine. So when people talk about the amount of water that a cow drinks as it being waste, that's completely and utterly illogical because it doesn't stay in the cow. It actually then irrigates the field that they're on. Some of the grass that they're eating, uh, the root system dies, and that also contributes to the biomass of soil. And over time, the thickness of soil will actually grow. This is what ruminants do. They actually grow soil, whereas when you take a plough to it, you destroy soil. And I think this is an important conversation that we ought to be having because soil is a finite resource and we can talk about what it's doing to human health and so on and so forth, but what happens when the soil runs out? So crop-based agriculture is not necessarily only bad for human health, but it's also can be catastrophic for the environment. And as far as I can see, nobody in politics who's prominent, is actually talking about this issue. And this is actually a, a real cause of concern for me because it might not be in our lifetimes, but it's not that far away. I suspect we're going to start seeing problems of the soil being denuded, at least in the next generation. Paul, I'm just nodding my head as you're uh, speaking here because as I'm looking at the data, the nutrient density for our vegetables, our crops are going down every single day you know, year, every, every generation, right? You talk about like, you, you have really, really big tomatoes, but the nutrient density in that tomato is very, very thin because of the problem describing. Well, we've actually got studies in Australia. So comparing from 1950 to about 1990, and they actually measured crops grown across all nutrients. And some nutrients were down 75%. Literally a quarter of the degree of nutrition in crops now is what they used to be. And this was published in the 1990s, so 30 years ago, So, but it's going to be far, far worse by now. The problem is that food actually takes nutrition out of soil and you don't actually need to replace all the nutrition back into the soil to have a crop necessarily grow. It needs certain nutrients, sure. So it might be deficient in nutrition, but it still looks good, it still grows, it's still green. And this nutrient deficiency is absolutely a huge problem and uh, that, that's going to affect everybody and uh, fortunately with ruminant-based agriculture then that that's not depleting the nutrition status of soil um, but if you're growing crops it absolutely does that a huge problem yeah and thank you for bringing the the data and the exact quantitative results from that i mean yeah that's, that's i think it is absolutely something that no one thinks about and I think when people are eating their vegetables or salads and that this is coming from a factory farmed crop cycle, essentially they're eating just a lot of water, right? There's like no nutrients in that in that vegetable, especially if they're grown in this style of uh, factory produced uh, agriculture. And this is absolutely, I mean, absolutely huge because these micronutrients do actually matter. They matter a lot. So if we take one, which is copper, we know that copper 
has a very important balancing role in terms of oxidative stress that can be caused by iron. Iron is a very reactive molecule. It's essential for good health. But if you have not enough copper, then the iron you have can actually become very pro-oxidant. And we see this in a condition called hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is a condition where you will genetically just absorb more iron from your diet than you, you, know, you normally would. Now, we used to think about this, and indeed most people do still do think about it as an iron overload condition, but it's not so much an iron overload condition as a nutrient imbalance because when you're absorbing extra iron coming in through these certain transporters, they have a finite capacity, and that means that you're displacing the ability to absorb other nutrients such as zinc and copper which share the same transporter. So it's not so much an excess in iron that's causing the oxidative damage and the deleterious outcomes we see in hemochromatosis, but a relative deficiency of these other nutrients like copper and zinc, which actually have a a role in stabilizing the iron molecules. So these micronutrients actually have a hugely important role. And the fact is that when we actually look at the cardiometabolic health of people with hemochromatosis, it's often far, far worse than average. We often see high levels of, extremely high levels of triglycerides. 100%. Paul, well, I feel like we could go another couple of hours talking about this topic as well as additional topics around athletic performance. I know that you've been starting to collaborate with prominent research like Luis Burke on in a supernova and, and, and how we actually think about low carb kitchen performance on endurance athletes. So let's save some of these topics for round two. But in the meantime, you know, where do people find you? I mean, again, I think some of your articulations are very, very clear. Some of the best explanations and expositions around this subject, you know, where do people find you and what projects are excited about working on the upcoming few months here? Well, uh, I'm on Twitter. So I'm on uh, Dr. Paul Mason on Twitter. I have a lot of lectures online there, either on my own YouTube channel, Dr. Paul Mason, or on the Low Carb Down Under channel. A project that I'm excited about coming up is we're running another Low Carb All Stars conference. We've got a great lineup of speakers. We're probably going to have in excess of 20 talks, so we're going to have it over two days. Um, we're talking about a who's who here, some, uh, some prominent names. Um, so I won't name drop yet, but hopefully soon we'll set a date. It's going to be in June. Um, we'll lock that in very shortly. It'll be streamed in three time zones. So it'll be uh, certainly wherever you are in the world, um, you'll be able to watch the, the stream there. And we're going to have live Q&As in every time zone. So it's going to be an absolute blast. So hopefully we get that off the ground. And uh, so keep an eye on my Twitter. If you uh, subscribe to me on Twitter, then I'll put some tweets out or hopefully uh, whatever normal channels, hopefully they come across you. Otherwise, yeah, I'm just uh, keeping my nose down and uh, digging into the books as I normally do. Well, continue fighting the good fight and educating the rest of us. Really a pleasure to have you on the program and hope to talk to you again soon. We'll stay in touch. Absolute great to be here. Thanks, Jeff.